All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us for this special edition fireside chat with Dr. Potsock. Um, my name is Shauna Snyder, and I will be your host this afternoon. Uh, I am a patient of Dr. Potsock's at uh, the NIH. A uh, little bit about my history, very, very briefly, I did have a bladder paraganglioma removed in 2019. Um, um, and so I'm also a volunteer. I'm um, doing some social media for the Fiopara Alliance, uh, helping to run their Twitter page. Um, and I will be joining the board of the Fiopara Alliance in the spring. So I'm doing a little bit of volunteer work uh, to kind of give back to the community um, that has helped me a lot, as I know many of you have been helped by the field pair community as well. Um, so I am here with Dr. Potsock, and I'll introduce him a little bit more in a minute. Um, but I do want to take a moment and um, to let you know kind of a few things, some housekeeping things up front. Um, that this is brought to you by the Fiopara Alliance. Uh, our mission is to empower patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, their families, and medical professionals through advocacy, education, and a global community of support while helping to advance research that accelerates treatments and cures. Um, we want to put a special thanks out to Progenix for making this webinar series possible through an educational grant. Um, we also would love it if you all do stay in touch with us through our social media accounts. Um, just put in at Fiopara and you will find our Instagram, our Facebook pages, um, as well if you would like to receive emails. Um, you can go to theopera.org and sign up for our e-newsletters. And this will give you a lot of updated information, future webinars, dates of things that are about to happen. So we, we really would love for you to sign up there. Um, so today our agenda is entirely a question and answer. Uh, so we have the famous Dr. Potsack from the NIH with us today. And um, he has graciously agreed to answer as many questions as we can get in in this hour. Um, and sometimes he's known to even go over a couple of minutes. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but most of our questions today have been already submitted. But we do have a chat feature. Feel free to submit questions there. And um, we'll be fielding those. And we'll, we'll try to answer as many of those as well today. Um, there are a lot of some similar questions that are often asked, so I have taken many of those, kind of condensed them so that we can ask a general question that hopefully will get answers to a lot of people all at one time. So if you, if you don't hear your question specifically asked, please put it in the chat, however, and we'll try to get to it today if we can. Okay. Um, so as a disclaimer, however, let me make sure that I say this, the information presented on this webinar is for educational purposes um, only and should not substitute for the advice of your doctors or, or any medical team because they have an in-depth knowledge of your medical history and current situation. Everyone is a little bit different. These present very differently. So please, please make sure that you are talking to your doctor, and, and we are just trying to educate you today. Hopefully, we'll, we'll make, that a, make this a, a great educational session so that you can take information maybe back to your doctor, and hopefully this will help you. Um, all right, so without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Potsock. Dr. Potsock is the chief, of sec the chief of section on medical neuroendocrinology of the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development which is one of the largest centers in the world to diagnose and treat patients with VO and para. Dr. Potsock is dedicated his career to providing the most cutting edge clinical care and advancing research for VO para. He serves on the VO para Alliance Medical Advisory Board. Um, most recently, Dr. Potsock received the Outstanding Clinical Investigator Award from the Endocrine Society. 
This annual award honors an internationally recognized clinical investigator who has contributed significantly to understanding the pathogenesis and therapy of endocrine and metabolic diseases. He was also the keynote speaker at the recent North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society's annual multidisciplinary symposium last month. Um, so let's get started. And uh, welcome, Dr. Potsock. And so I'm actually going to start off with a few questions that are a little bit more on the fun side. So I, I want people to get to know you. If you, if you haven't met Dr. Potsack yet, he's a very fun guy. He likes to have fun. So I'm going to ask you a couple of fun questions. Okay, ready? I am ready, Shauna. Okay. If I were to buy you a drink, would it be coffee or tea? It would be tea. Tea. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Um, favorite color? Favorite color, of course, blue. Blue. Okay. I could have guessed. I could have guessed. Now, you are famous for your shirts and ties, and today you have on a special tie for us. Can you, can you show us your tie? I can show you my tie. Uh, yes, Christmas ties. <laughs> Look at that. Christmas ties, special for this occasion. I thought that it would be really appropriate to have this one, you know, because it's, yes. you know, like cold season. Yes, and you are famous for your shirts and ties. We love them. And so today you have a Christmas tie on. We're, we are excited about that. All right, you ready to dig in? Yes, I am. And first of all, Shona, uh, I would like to thank you for a very nice introduction. It's really great uh, honor and pleasure to be here today. And to be, of course, you know, the seminar to be supported by Fio Para Alliance as well as Progenix. And of course, I will be happy to answer as many as questions I can. And as Shona said, you know, don't worry about the time. Even if we are a little bit uh, over one hour, I think that they will be okay because I really would like to answer those questions and help many patients. Of course, you know, we will maybe not be able to cover all the questions, but if we can cover the most important and many, that would be great. So I'm here and we can start. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm going to start off by asking a few questions that we hear a lot, and and maybe you can clear up some things um, that are floating out there, and I don't think people really truly know the answer. So here's the first one. Do you consider, or are FIOs and PARAs considered cancer? Yeah, there are actually the definition of the fioparagangrioma, the new definition of fioparagangrioma is actually that they all are considered as a uh, metastatic tumors, so as a cancers. And the reason is that some patients may have, a, for example, fiochromocytoma paragangrioma at age 20, they can develop metastatic lesions 15, 20 years, even 25 years later. So the, we feel that there, in all pheochromocytoma paragangliomas, there is certain potential to metastasize. Whether they will metastasize or not, this is another question. And it's very difficult and complicated. And we still don't have very good markers to predict uh, whether those tumors will be metastatic. But we consider them as a cancers. That's correct. OK. OK, very good. Um, what advice would you give those who are symptomatic, they may have elevated metanephrines, they might have some uptake on an MIBG or some scan, but there's not an actual lesion or nodule or tumor that is actually seen. What advice would you give them for moving forward? What should they do next? Oh, this is a little bit complicated, tricky question. So let's say, mm -hmm. you know, the patient, is it, if the patient has elevated metanephrines, it depends how much they are elevated. Everything what is two times above the upper reference limit is worrisome, okay? It's always mm -hmm. worrisome. You know, the day before was three times, just now it's two times above the upper reference limit. So be aware of that. If it is 100 upper reference limit and you have a 200, it's already, you know, the problematic, you know, for uh, for the uh, for the patients. 
So if we go to MIBG, it depends when there is the positivity. Usually the positivity is in adrenal gland or adrenal glands. You have to be aware of something. There are two MIBGs. One is with iodine-123, one is with iodine-131. 131 iodine is practically not used, and it was replaced by iodine-123. Iodine-123 can be positive. You know, the MIBG labeled with iodine-123 can be positive in normal adrenal gland. If I take the population, normal population of, uh, you know, of uh, some subjects, then I will have, you know, 100 subjects, that can be positive up to maybe 60 or 80 percent that can be slight positivity so don't assume that if you have an elevated metanephrine and slight positivity on my mibg that you have a pheochromocytoma because the slight positivity if you know usually will be in the adrenal gland okay you have to have Number one, you have to have a very good radiologist who has experience with MIBG and who will tell you that it's most likely, you know, mild elevation. It's not really suggested uh, for uh, the presence of pheochromocytoma because it's usually, not always, but usually it's a mar- a mar- much more intense. And the second, the plasma metanephrines or urinary metanephrines can be elevated to something else. For example, if you have a medication. So you really will need, you know, to put all these things together. And that can be done usually by somebody who is expert in pheoparaganglioma and somebody who has experience with the imaging. And there are not too many. Believe me, there are not too many. There are very good reading MIBG scan. You have to have somebody who really has an experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that it's a very complicated one in Definitely it's more complicated yeah. experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, more experience to find out whether you have really diagnosis of pheochromocytoma or, for example, paraganglioma. But usually, if slightly a positive MIBG is usually positive in the adrenal glands, either in one or two. And also okay. remember, if you had a previous adrenalectomy, so the second adrenal gland or contralateral adrenal gland is becoming bigger, you know, hyperplastic. Mm-hmm. So very often, the patients who do not have actually contralateral pheochromocytoma, because they previously had, for example, in the right adrenal gland, where left adrenal gland will become hyperplastic and the MIBG will be positive, does not mean that they have another pheochromocytoma in left adrenal gland, because the left Mm -hmm. adrenal gland is becoming hyperplastic, which means bigger, and takes a little Mm -hmm. bit more MIBG. So be aware of that because very, very often patients are coming and uh, telling us, oh my God, you know, I have the pheochromocytoma in uh, contralateral um, adrenal gland, but it's not uh, a pheochromocytoma, it's abnormal uptake because of hyperplastic adrenal gland. Okay, very good. I think that's going to help a lot of people. I really do. Okay, um, can a non secreting, non genetic, Theo or para start secreting, especially if it is a glomus vagal. Oh, Shona, and uh, an old patients, they decided, they, they, they decided to give me the very difficult questions at the beginning. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> so if, you, if you have a head and a paraganglioma, you are saying that you had the you know, uh, the tumor that was not secreting, actually we say not producing and then not secreting catecholamines or metanephrines. Here it would be either dopamine, methoxytyramine or norepinephrine or metanephrine. And if that tumor can become positive, uh, biochemically positive later on, I don't think so. I think that if they are negative from the beginning, they will be negative. You know, even if you take... Uh, if you, for example, have say, certain uh, treatment options, like, for example, external radiation or, uh, for example, chemotherapy. So I have not seen it. And usually if this situation is coming, uh, that there is usually another tumor. Uh, the tumor is not usually in the head and neck because only less than 5% of these tumors will produce and release catecholamines, especially norepinephrine or metanephrine. For dopamine, methoxytyramine, uh, the, mm, 
the percentage will be higher, will be approximately 20%, maybe even higher. But usually those patients may have tumor somewhere else in the body. And that tumor somewhere else is secreting, I mean, producing and secreting catecholamines. And the reason is that at least in the US, if somebody has a head and neck paraganglioma, there is 40% chance that that will be the tumor that will have certain type of the mutation, the gene mutation that is contributing to that tumor. And if somebody has a so-called hereditary pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, here paraganglioma because it's a head and neck, they usually have much higher likelihood to have a multiple tumors. And multiple mm. tumors means that the tumor will be located somewhere in the body, whether it will be in the abdomen, pelvis, or chest, we don't know, but it can be can be there. And we saw the, those patients, and they converted from negative biochemical results to positive biochemical result. But what I said, this is usually because there is multiplicity. Okay, okay. Okay, let me ask, uh, you, you told us a little bit of data there. Let me ask you an, another question or two um, about data. So can you give us a little bit of an update on any new data that we know um, about maybe the number of people that are now being diagnosed? It does seem that we have more people being diagnosed, do we know that there, the numbers are going up? Are we getting better at diagnosing? What, what do you? What can you tell us about data? Yeah, so this is also a little bit complicated. We feel <laughs> that more people are becoming diagnosed because the the awareness of uh, about the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma is much better. Not only that we have a here Fiopara Alliance, we have a other you know organization. We have a lot of articles in very good journals, and today you know everything is practically accessible, as you know. So many many scientists can read the articles that through the internet, some websites that before it was not possible whatsoever because they needed to wait you know to get the, actually the, the the journal prescription or some article they pay for. But, you know, there is free access for many journals. So the community overall is uh, very well educated and not community or only healthcare professionals, but also patients are becoming really aware of your chromocytoma paraganglioma. They have information. You can go to Internet, get the information practically very quickly. My feeling is that actually the number that is, I uh, would say, higher for the pheochromocytoma paraganglima is that we are aware of these tumors. These tumors are diagnosed earlier. We have a much better CT and MRI than we had before. We have also functional imaging. And on the top of that, we have very precise and very good uh, and sensitive biochemical methods, like especially measurement of plasma or urine, metanephrines and in some places also methoxytyramine so which is wonderful i can tell you for example if you have an adrenal tumor and i will i will simplify something if you have an adrenal tumor then if you use the for example plasma metanephrines you can diagnose the tumor will be about six or seven millimeters so which is very very small, small tumor you can find it by ct or mri but it's at the edge you know because it's just uh, just very small, but the biochemistry will be positive. If you would use catecholamines, like we used to do it before, let's say even maybe 10, 15 years ago, although metanephrines were introduced around 2000 or slightly after 2000, at least in plasma. So the catecholamines will detect the tumors that there will be approximately uh, 1.5 centimeters. So you see the difference, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so yes. and this difference is very, very obvious. Okay, so uh, better techniques, uh, better be, uh, better imaging uh, uh, approaches, uh, education of the patients, health, healthcare professionals. So I think that this is the reason why we see more patients with the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. I don't think that there is something, or I am not aware of that. Maybe I'm missing something, or maybe, you know, somebody can comment about that. That is maybe some reason 
why we would have uh, uh, higher incidence for pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, but I don't think that this is the case except for what I said. Mm -hmm. So you highly recommend the plasma metanephrine test. Uh, put, put, put this way, I recommend plasma, but it depends. It depends. If you, you, there is, when you put the experts together, they will not agree whether plasma or urine, but they will agree uh -huh. that two times above the upper reference limit is worrisome. Okay. It's definitely okay. worrisome. But uh, whether you will use the plasma or urine, you know, there is no big difference. If you combine sensitivity and specificity, it will be better for plasma. Sensitivity is slightly better. It's about 97%, 97.4. For uh, urine, the sensitivity 94, 94.3. But the specificity is the same for urine or plasma. So, you know, I, I don't think it, it matters. But... If you have a something that is suggestive that you may have a pheochromocytoma, for the example, patient has abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, goes to the emergency room, they will do the CT scan, they find, uh, for example, the adrenal nodule, suggestive for possible, you know, can be tumor, can be, for example, pheochromocytoma, then I would maybe suggest to use the plasma uh, yeah. metanephrines, where do you have a high or uh, uh, the, the pretest probability is higher, you know, so pretest means the test is like um, the measurement of plasma metanephrines, for example, or urine metanephrines. So pretest probability is already high because you have already tumor in the adrenal gland where the pheochromocytoma is found. So I would suggest mm -hmm. that to use the plasma. If the, the pretest probability is low, for example, patient is coming to the physician with some symptoms and signs that could be related to catecholamines, like, for example, nervousness, sometimes anxiety, a little bit unusual sweating, hypertension, that is sometimes may not be well controlled, but that's very common in the society. So the, the pretest probability to have your chromocytoma is, is pretty low, then it doesn't matter whether you use the plasma or urine. Of course, the, if you use the plasma, it's sometimes a little bit easier. Urine you have to collect for 24 hours. You know, you should avoid, you know, certain activity. Of course, you should avoid certain medication. Also, you know, some um, some situation, for example, smoking that could actually falsely increase the uh, uh, catecholamines in the circulation and goes, you know, to into, into, the, into the urine. So there are, you know, so uh, some limitations. So I think that plasma is a little bit easier. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, what do we know about the percentage of reoccurrence after surgery for those who you know, look like maybe they're what we call one and done. Um, what do we know about any percentage of recurrence? No, it depends, you know. So first of all, it depends what kind of tumor you have, you know, if you have a hereditary or not, because of course the recurrence for hereditary, for example, pheochromocytoma paraganglioma is definitely higher than for the sporadic ones. The second uh, the important aspect is who is operating on you, okay? So, and it's interesting that many patients, at least, you know, that's my experience. I'm not saying it's happening, you know, uh, everywhere, but many patients are coming and they are operated by uh, surgeons who do not have experience in pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. I don't saying, I am not saying anything against the surgeon. They are fantastic, wonderful, but, you know, sometimes it's not only, you know, being fantastic, wonderful. Sometimes it's also about the experience and experience counts. And because they are rare tumors, of course, they don't have so many chances as a surgeon, you know, to see those patients. So I always tell patients that to go somewhere where actually, what I, what I actually always say, 
you go uh, somewhere where a rare is common okay and it is because yes. rare means you know pheochromocytoma paraganglioma and those surgeons will will be able to tell you what to expect what to do how to put things together and i can tell you it is experience and we have a very great uh, uh, surgeons here in the United States and, you know, many, many places, uh, wonderful endocrine surgeons. So they can actually do very good job and they do very good job. And the um, recurrence, even for hereditary ones like pheochromocytomas can be maybe about 10%, you know, so which is pretty low, 5, 10%. It used to be 30%, but uh, wow. uh, 30% yeah. uh, was you know based on you know maybe less experience maybe waiting you know for a long period of time because it depends also on the size of the tumor if you have a tumor that is three centimeter you know it's much more difficult than if you have a tumor that is would be for example one or 1.5 centimeter okay okay good information okay um Recently, did a you did a talk uh, about some new treatments that are out there. Can you give us just a brief overview of what some of those new treatment methods are? Oh, new treatments. That's that's very broad, and you know that we would spend quite a lot of time. But new treatments, of course, you know there are you know in terms of radiation, but it's pretty well known, you know, and came from very good places like MD Anderson or UPenn. You know, using, for example, MIBG, I specific activity MIBG, which is called Azedra. And uh, that's, uh, that's very good and promising treatment. Another one is Lutatera, that is using uh, actually dotatate uh, linked to lutetium. And is also radioactive treatment, both like Azedra, Lutatera are injected uh, into the vein. So, uh, and uh, <clears throat> they go to the tumor. What is interesting for the new treatment options here, for example, at the NIH, we are looking for patients who have a progressive disease. So because if you have a metastatic disease, you can have a stable disease, although it's metastatic, and you can be treated. But you can have a metastatic disease that is progressive. So NIH is especially focusing on those that they have a metastatic disease, but it's progressive, which is definitely plus and we are approximately halfway through, you know, with the clinical trial. It's done with the with the NCI that is playing really important pivotal role, you know, in this treatment. And I think that that would be very important to see how the patient will be responding to uh, to this radioactive treatment if they have a progressive disease. The other treatment options are those that they are related to, for example, chemotherapy or some combinations. And one of them is, for example, using temozolomide, the so-called PARP inhibitor. I cannot go into the details, but there is something promising, especially for patients that they have a mutation in the Krebs cycle, and especially those that they have a SDHB, but also SDHD, SDHA mutation. And uh, those patients can profit from combination using temozolomide and, for example, olaparib. So we think that that would be, this could be very interesting. The other one is to use the cold somatostatin analogs because the pheochromocytoma, I told you about as a, the alutatera. Alutatera is based on the uh, overexpression of somatostatin receptors. Those receptors are like, you know, target molecules that they are on the cell membrane. And if you have too many, it's very good because the lutatera can actually bind to those receptors. But sometimes you mm -hmm. cannot use the radioactive material, whatever the reason is. So you have another op option to use the cold analogs. Cold means that they will be non-radioactive and they will actually attach to these receptors and they will also stabilize or slow the tumor growth or so, uh, in some patients stabilize. It's very important, especially in some patients, for example, with inoperable head and neck uh, paragangliomas. And the last one, which is also very promising, is, for example, to use the HIF2-alpha inhibitor. HIF means hypoxia inducible factor. And this inhibitor is actually inhibiting HIF. HIF is actually 
factor that affects a lot of genes in the in different tumors, especially in pheochromocytoma and neuroendocrine, some neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, those genes, if they are affected, they promote the tumor growth. So there is the international study right now, NIH will be involved and we will start everything, I think, from January using HIF2 alpha inhibitor for patients with actually, uh, for example, metastatic disease. And we will start, what is good, that we will start it not only for adults, but also for children. And we feel that. Uh, for some patients with pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, and I would say, again, they are related to Krebs cycle or so-called hypoxia signaling pathway, it can be very, very rewarding. So we will see what the data will show. Of course, sometimes it can be completely different, but uh, there are some reports already that, you know, those uh, approaches, especially using HIV2 inhibitors, can be um, can be helpful and can lead to very good responses. Very exciting. That's that's exciting news and good for I'm, I'm sure a lot of people who are listening to hear that there there are some treatments yeah. on the horizon. We're look we're waiting to see what the results of our clinical trials are. Excellent. Very good. Yeah, and I want to, um, and I wanted to say I wanted to say that thanks to NIH, really we have several of these clinical trials. We don't have an Azedra, but we have. Uh, most of these clinical trials here at the NIH. So I think that we will be definitely happy to help patients with metastatic disease and to provide them with some treatment options. Great. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Um, so, so on the line of treatment, um, for those patients who have had a vagal, so, you know, a head and neck, um, and maybe have had a surgery and they're worried about their vocal cords. This has been, we've had several questions about this. Are there any new techniques or uh, is there anything coming up that would allow a patient to maybe save their vocal cords or after the fact help to improve those vocal cords so they don't lose their voice? So this is uh, this is complicated. First of all, I'm not ENT surgeon and mm -hmm. uh, neurosurgeon, but I can tell you from the uh, from the surgery aspect or approach, there is not anything new that that would be, for example, for vagal paraganglioma. This to be very very carefully assessed. And I know that maybe there are the patients today that they were successfully operated at some places because, you know, surgeons are just, you know, wonderful and they have a good experience. But I can tell you, honestly, you have to be very, very careful because most patients do not have a very good outcome. And it depends on, you know, the size of the tumor. Although we usually, at least at the NIH, we don't prefer, you know, to operate on the vocal paraganglioma unless there is some problem. For example, they are growing a little bit faster or there is the vocal cord paralysis or there is, you know, some very severe pain or some other problems like cranial neuropathy that the patient needs to have operation. If you take the mm -hmm. operation and if you take, for example, external beam radiation or any type of the radiation, because they are, for example, cyber knife, gamma knife, et cetera, it depends. So the, uh, the outcomes are very good. The responses of the patients are about 80, 90%, okay? And mm -hmm. usually without very severe consequences. Uh, so you have to really be very careful what you choose. I'm not against the operation of vehicle paraganglioma. I think that some, especially the small one, those that they have chance, you know, to be operated successfully should be considered for, uh, for an operation, but has to be done by extremely, extremely good neurosurgeon, very well experienced, and there are only very few, very few ones. Uh, but there are some, and we have uh, some patients that I am following up uh, because they were operated at a certain place, and the outcomes are very good. I also would like to tell patients that, of course, 
like uh, uh, ne- like all neurosurgical, not all, but many neurosurgical procedures may not be very cheap. So uh, sometimes uh, um, these operations can be uh, very expensive. So the patient should be aware of that and talk with their physicians and really to put together pros and cons and to compare it with the external beam radiation, whether they would get, you know, the same outcomes or not. Okay, that's great advice, yeah. great advice. Um, if someone were trying to determine whether they should remove their tumor or not, so, you know, let's say that they their doctor is pretty sure that they do have, you know, a feel or pair and the patient is deciding pros and cons, do I remove it or do I not remove it? What would, what would, if it was your patient, what would you say? That is interesting and very appropriate question. So I will tell you something, you know, if you have a pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma and uh, this is a tumor that is producing and secreting either catecholamines or metanephrines, I would always vote for the surgical procedure, so surgical removal, okay? Of course, you know, if they are in the location that it can be very complicated, difficult, it's another story. But in general, most of these uh, pheos or paragangliomas can be removed, especially when they are smaller. And the reason is that you have a secreting tumor and then secreting tumor in certain situations, whether you will be under physical, under psychological stress, or something is going to happen to you may... Uh, secrete a lot of a lot of catecholamines in millions of molecules that can be absolutely danger 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 mm-hmm. you know young young ones will most likely deal with that although they still may have consequences but when you are getting older you can easily get myocardial infarction you can easily get stroke you know some ischemia organ ischemia and this is very complicated and very difficult and can be can be you know from tumor that is one centimeter uh, in size. It's n- I'm right. not talking about the tumor that is three or four centimeters. So I would always suggest you know those patients to be operated if they are actually negative in terms of catecholamines metanephrine, so called biochemically silent. I will simplify everything. So let's say biochemically silent. The tumor is stable, and if the patient doesn't mind you know to check on this tumor every, let's say, 6 to 12 months, and later on, maybe every one or two years. It depends what kind of tumor is there, where it's located, what is the genetic background, and the tumor is stable and the patient does not mind. I think it's okay if the if the tumor will be there, but they have to be aware that the tumor can grow and, of course, can affect uh, surrounding uh, tissues and structures and, of course, uh, can become metastatic as well. Okay, so it's really, it really depends what everybody wants. But usually when we, overall, I can tell you that overall, regardless even whether these tumors are secreting something or not, which means catecholamine slash metanephrine, you know, if we prove that the patient has a pheochromocytoma paraganglioma and is surgically accessible and our surgeons agrees to operate on the patient and patient is a good condition that can go through the operation, we always suggest surgical removal. Okay, okay. Mm. Um, if a mm. patient is pregnant, is there, does this, does this change anything? Can't could could we do a surgery before they deliver? Do we recommend surgery after they deliver? How long after they deliver? Are there any kind of guidelines that you could put out? Yeah, so that's yeah, there are you know some some options if they are pregnant or you know to do the uh, to to have the surgery. Of course, you know, if the pheochromocytoma paraganglioma is found or they can wait uh, after, you know, so at the end of the pregnancy and uh, uh, then, you know, to be to be operated. 
There is very interesting paper, I think, from Dr. Bankos that came from Lancet Endocrinology. Patients can look at that. There are also some comments that we <clears throat> made, you know, for that uh, for that uh, paper. And uh, it's either way, it's actually possible. It depends on the uh, physicians uh, to decide whether the patient can be operated and when the patient will be operated, you know, cannot be too late, okay? But uh, mm -hmm. it can be done after, you know, so fetus is, you know, I think it's removed, you know, the delivery is uh, proceeding and then actually to remove your chromocytoma or paraganglium. You cannot do it before because if you would actually manipulate this tumor, you release a lot of catecholamines and they will actually cause the ischemia. So uh, that would be actually detrimental. Uh, those patients, nevertheless, if they are pregnant, they have to have the uh, blockade and they have to start on the blockade as soon as possible. That was also in that paper, which I would definitely agree with that. And the outcomes of patients who were on blockade very soon during the pregnancy, which means if the pheochromocytoma paraganglima was discovered, for example, just before the pregnancy, a few weeks ago, or, you know, immediately after, you know, they found, the uh, women found that they were pregnant, you know, to put them on the blockade, because sooner you put them on the blockade, the outcome actually is much better than if they are not on blockade or the blockade is done, for example, seven days before the removal of the pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma. Okay. But I definitely okay. recommend that article. And from Dr. Landers also, Dr. Landers wrote very interesting papers about the pregnancy of pheochromocytoma paraganglioma. All right. So there are papers out there that yeah, patients and they can are very their hands on they should read. Yeah. And they are, they are very, very available. And I think that free of charge, you know, you can just uh, load, you know, the papers and you, you can read about yeah. it. Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, let's switch gears a little bit, uh, and talk about genetics. That tends to be a pretty common question that we get as well. Do you know, this was, this was a little bit more specific here. Uh, is there a connection between the FH mutation and Pheopara? Of course it is. You know, it was described okay. by French group, you know, <clears throat> very nicely. And yes, there is, and there is good connection. They, those tumors are pre pretty rare, uh, and uh, but they are actually existing. And they also behave on a little bit more aggressive side. They are not so aggressive, like for example, SDHB or SDHA, but they are definitely more aggressive. So which means that uh, patient develop metastatic disease. And uh, for the FH, they present the same way like other uh, pheoparaganglioma that are related to mutation in the Krebs cycle because fumarate hydratase is located in the Krebs cycle. So they have a noradrenergic phenotype. If I talk about noradrenergic phenotype, those patients have elevated norepinephrine or normethanephrine or both. They cannot have elevated epinephrine or metanephrine, okay? It's not existing, okay? So they are very well <clears throat> positive on some functional imaging studies, uh, <clears throat> like, you know, other Krebs cycle related uh, hereditary pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas. Yes, there is definitely uh, there are not too many those with the FH, but there are definitely some. Okay. Okay. If um, if you are if you are screening between an adult and a child, are there any differences? Should 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 we do genetic screening the same? Are there differences between child and adult? Yeah. So you do you do practically the same way. The only uh, only question would be when do you start? Okay. So you can start practically immediately. But it you know, depends if you would like, as a parent, your child will go through the testing. If the, your child will not go through further testing, even knowing, you know, what is there, you know, it's there, there is no reason to do 
genetic testing immediately, like, you know, being, for example, five years old or three years old. But if the, the parents are really um, convinced that uh, and they, they have a good understanding that after that, you know, the, after genetic testing, if it is positive, you have to actually measure blood pressure. You have to measure catecholamines, methanephrines on this uh, certain regular basis. Then it's definitely very important that the children will have genetic testing and you will know what is going on with your children because there are some tumors, uh, let's say VHL, uh, uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia to, for example, the type 2, a uh, SDHB, SDHD that can come, you know, early you know, during the childhood. You know, we have some pay, we had some patients that they were, for example, or they uh, at that time eight years old, seven years old, nine years old, ten years old. So it's very important actually to know the mutation type and to do the genetic testing. The differences are in the upper reference limit because the upper reference limit for Normethanephrine is different in children versus adults. And I will not go into the details, but if somebody would be interested, they can contact me. Dr. Graham Eisenhofer put together some interesting nomogram, you know, that based on the age that you put, you know, the results and you will see, you know, what's going on. But I can tell you the upper reference limit for those that who are young or very young is much lower than, for example, for older ones. Okay, so okay. <clears throat> normal, normal upper reference is 112, you know, for adults. But if you have somebody who is, you know, five years or seven years old, the upper reference limit will be lower. So which means okay. that if you will have, a, for example, the value 80 or 90 in somebody who is eight, five or six year old will be abnormal. And you cannot compare it to something which is for adult, which is 112, based on our upper reference limit. It depends on the institution. You have to be aware of that because you can miss uh, some children with the fear of paraganglioma because you have to okay. know those upper reference limits. Okay, that's good information. I think we do have some yeah. parents with questions who are trying to and get just, their children yeah. focused. Yeah, and I will be happy to communicate with them, and I can send them even a nomogram from Dr. Graham Eisenhofer, who really put together a very good one, and they can use it. It's very simple to use it, and they will immediately know what is going on. Okay. And they, right, can, very good. They, can, they can inform their doctors, because the doctors most likely will not know, but if they will be informed appropriately, I'm pretty sure that most doctors will definitely accept that. Okay. Okay, very good, very good. Um, I don't. Th this one's a little bit out of out of my. I don't know anything about gist, G I S T. Oh. But we have a question that has come in. Um, is there a, is there? Well, can can you just kind of speak to any factors that would determine whether you might have the gist if you're. SDH, you know, with that genetic, that kind of gene mutation line um, versus Theopara with that genetic line or both. It, can, can you have both? And I don't know if I'm asking this question correctly. So you'll, you can inform us here on this. <laughs> well, I think, you know, whoever asked, you know, whoever asked the question, they, they want me to be specialized uh, or specialist in the gist, you know, gastrointestinal okay. stomach tumor. Uh, I'm not really very good specialist in gist, but I can tell you they can be, you know, together. They can be, you know, separately, you know, which means either gist or, you know, for pheoparacanglioma and vice versa. They are usually related to succinate hydrogenase mutation as DHABCD. And uh, some special events, especially for the SDHC, that, you know, it's, it's called hypermethylation, but I will not go into that. The important, mm -hmm. uh, uh, important, I would say, symptom signs from clinical, you know, the side is that the patient usually has stomach pain. They can have, uh, uh, for example, bleeding. So their stool will be, for example, black. Uh, they will have, you know, le less appetite. Uh, they can lose some weight. They are not just feeling uh, feeling okay. So, 
And in that case, they should always have endoscopy, upper GI endoscopy, to find out what's, go what's going uh, uh, on and uh, to try to locate the gist. And the gist belongs to GI and also those uh, surgeons who are actually very good in GI surgeries. And we do gist here at the NIH uh, and his NCI, for example, Dr. Hernandez and his group and others. And they have a very, very good, uh, very good experience. But it's not only an eye. There are many, many very good places, you know, in New York, you know, you know, MD Anderson and some other very good places. They, they, they have a very, very, very good experience, slow catering and uh, other places. OK, so. OK. Uh, but always remember, you have something with the stomach. You don't feel comfortable. You know, you are, you know, okay. not eating well, you know, so. Something, something is going on. This would not okay. be found with your paraganglioma. Usually, there are special okay. um, situation, but usually not. Okay, okay. Is it possible for a genetic mutation to revert to normal in a subsequent test later? Say it, again, say it again to revert normal if there was positive and then revert to normal. That's what I think they're they're asking. So it sounds like maybe they had a test and the test showed they did have some ge genetic mutation, but then they had the test again and then they didn't have it. Is that you mean, possible? If you, we are talking about the genetic testing. Yes. Yeah, it's genetic testing because it was false positive. The false positivity comes about 5%, 5 6%. Five, six percent. Okay. It depends on the company. You know, of course, you know, that can be positive and then you know you repeat and it will be it will be negative. It's not very common, maybe even less than five percent. And uh, the same is false negative. You can have a false negative, and I think it's also about five percent or so. It depends on you know who is doing that and false negative, and then you will have a false positive. In a 20 years history here, I think we have a two false negative uh, ones, and they were retested, and then we found that they were actually positive. So it happens, actually, but it really depends okay. on who is running the genetic test. And so, would, so you would recommend to run the test one more time? Uh, depends, depends. Good question. A little bit uh, hard to <laughs> answer in a very short, limited time. Put this one. If you okay. have a family member with pheoparaganglioma and that the family member has, for example, FH, let's say, or SDHB mm -hmm. or SDHD, VHL, and your test will come positive and you have also something maybe with pheoparaganglioma or at least some positive biochemistry, I would not repeat it. It's pretty much straightforward, okay? okay. If you don't have mm -hmm. a family history and just suddenly you will get that there is a positive test and nobody, nobody in the family had, you know, pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, then you question that, okay? And then okay. you can repeat actually genetic testing, except for maybe SDHA. SDHA practically that's the, there is no family history for SDHA, none, zero, almost zero. There are some cases, but almost zero. And that's, I would not be su surprised. The other option would be, to, you know, to test family members, like, you know, your parents, for example. And if one of mm -hmm. these parents will be positive, of course, you will have actually this mutation if we are talking about the germline. There are some other like somatic, but we will not go into that because they can be de novo. And there are many de novo actually mutations, especially for VHL and neurofibromatosis, but we will not go into that. This is related to tumors. I was talking about the blood as a germline. That's something you get, you inherit from your parents. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. We have... A few more minutes, so I'm gonna ask. We have more, we have, Shona. We have more minutes. We we we, we can get, get you know five or ten minutes over. That's okay. That's okay. fine. Yeah. Okay. I promise. All right. We'll All right. To... Okay. Very good. Um, we have a couple of questions that have come in about autonomic dysfunction after surgery. Is that something that no. you all are looking at or are you following or? Can you can you no, give us some education? We don't, 
we usually don't we fear we don't deal with that yeah it's coming especially you know for example for carotid body tumors you know for head and neck paragangliomas that you know that can be you know the uh, the problem and autonomic dysfunction and we usually refer those patients to uh, to certain specialists uh, and to work uh, actually with those specialists it's not very common i have to say you know, so for the autonomic dysfunction, usually, you know, because barrel reflex, uh, you know, is, for example, uh, affected and it's very, it's pretty complicated and difficult because those patients can be miserable. Okay. So, but we usually mm-hmm. refer to certain specialists. I don't deal with the autonomic dysfunctions because, as I said, you know, the treatment is pretty complex and needs, you know, very good uh, specialists. You know, it's better to use the specialist than to than to than to come to the patient and to tell I know everything and I can treat everything, which is not true. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Um, here's a question from the chat. Uh, could you address mm-hmm. how to pre- how to prepare for the different scans? How to prepare for the different scan? It depends. You know. So. You know, you have the anatomic imaging, CT and MRI. You know, you have to look at, of course, your kidney function. You have to be well hydrated. Mm-hmm. You know, there are some uh, uh, limits in terms of, for example, the level of creatinine and creatinine clearance. Everything is usually discussed with the, the patients, what the rules and guidelines are. Then can be, of course, allergic reaction. If somebody had the allergic reaction, they have to have... Uh, for example, medication, including some steroids and uh, antihistaminics. Uh, for the MRI, usually it does not come, but there are sometimes uh, reactions that they can, you know, cause, for example, pulmonary fibrosis, etc. Uh, even it's very, very rare. For the test, like, you know, function imaging, to, I'm talking positron emission tomography, this is very, very limited because there are no practically any allergic reactions. And I never ever heard that the patient would have any allergic reaction to fluorodeoxy glucose, fluorodopa, you know, the gallium, you know, for example, the dotatate scan or other scans. So, of course, you still have to look at the kidney function and everything, which is, uh, which I told you that is important. And of course, you know, pregnancy test. Everybody you know, who is, you know, at the age that they can be pregnant, they have to have a pregnancy test no later than 24 hours. Uh, usually at our institution is no later than 24 hours before the scan. Okay. Okay, very good. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so another question, feel, feel pair of crisis. So oh. if... I'm assuming that I'm assuming that this person is, you know, referring to the tumor has been manipulated or there's been a huge release of, you know, catecholamines. And so they're in a crisis. Um, Does that is that more likely to happen with a larger tumor, a smaller tumor? And and again, what should a person who does have a tumor uh, maybe what could they do to prevent that? Is there, you know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of adding some words in here, but I'll just have you speak to it. Yeah, that is excellent question, you know. So even small tumors can be devastating and very dangerous compared to large tumors because the large tumors, uh, even if you think that they have a lot of catecholamines, they, be, they can be necrotic, you know, so they can be undifferentiated. So... They may have sometimes even less, you know, the catecholamines, uh, you know, than compared to smaller tumors. But overall, Mm -hmm. you know, the patient must be very careful. And still, I would say that the larger tumors in general, in general, would be a little bit more danger than those that they are small tumors. If the patients know that they have a large tumors, they are secreting uh, in catecholamine slash metanephrine, they have to have always, they have to be always on blockade. Always mm-hmm. on blockade. Because it's not about the surgery. 
And we wrote about that several articles, and we have sometimes arguments with you know colleagues from Europe, and they think you know the patient they don't need to be on any blockade before surgery. No, you have to be on blockade before surgery because the surgery is coming in a two three weeks. What, what you don't know what will happen during those two three weeks. You will be upset right. because you lost the job. <clears throat> you will be upset that you will be in accident. You will be upset that something will happen with your home or with your family. You will be under stress. When you are under stress, it's uh, in generally speaking, it's very well known that these tumors are activated. What the activation, what is the trigger exactly? I mean, the trigger is stress, but what is exactly, you know, mechanism is not very well known. And you can be in very complicated, difficult situation. Very, and I saw it. You know, I had several patients that they end up with accident, they end up with stroke after accident because they were not properly blocked and they supposed mm. to be blocked. So whenever you visit the doctor and the doctor will tell you, you have secreting pheochromocytoma paraganglioma, at least in the United States at, at the present time, at the present time, you know, you are entitled to get the blockade to actually diminish the effect of catecholamines that can be released, not when you are reading the book, most likely, when you are in good situation, when you are in pleasant situation, but when you are not in such pleasant and good situation. And it may happen to everybody. You never know, any minute. You don't know what will happen in a five, 10 minutes from now, okay? So you have to be blocked. The same like you have an infection. You know, have, for example, pneumonia. You don't go with the pneumonia that they will get better or you will be, be waiting for something. You get some medication, you know, before yeah. that or, you know, for something for myocardial infarction because you have a, you have a, a, a coronary artery disease and before they operate on you, they will put you on some medication. They will not tell you, right. you will not be on medication. And that is exactly the same. Okay, so be aware of that. And because mm -hmm. really we saw many, many, many patients and they did not end up very well. And we want so alpha blockade before, alpha before beta, correct? Uh, uh, usually alpha before beta, there are exceptions. And if somebody wants me to write, you know, to know about this exception, I will tell them. The exception is they have an epinephrine secreting tumor or tumors, especially multiple endocrine neoplasia. You can put them first on beta blockade and then alpha blockade, but this is only the exception. And if somebody would like to um, learn about that or has the similar situation, please write me and I will be happy uh, to, to comment about that. Okay. I think I'm running out of questions. Um, Are you sure? We did very well. You know, it's two minutes after four, you know, so. We're, we're doing pretty well. Um, yeah. This yeah. is this is a, well, this is a metastasis question. I feel like we have, we've sort of talked about those. Um, I'm looking through our chat questions real quick here. Um, Vitamin C, this is an interesting one. Uh, oh. Is it helpful to take vitamin C if you have a para history? Sure, you know, we published this paper in Clinical Cancer Research and it's an interesting paper. It was published, I think, two years ago and we actually feel that it can be very helpful for patients, but uh, uh, this was experimental study. So, uh, and you, we feel that if the vitamin C will work, will work in high actually doses. You cannot get like five grams, 10 grams IV infusion, five, 10 grams will not help. I can tell you honestly. My feeling is that when we look at the experimental studies, those, those doses will need to be much higher and they will need to be repeated at least few we, uh, I mean, a few days a week, okay? So, okay. and there are some patients that are taking vitamin C. I cannot disclose everything, but uh, based on the information I received, they were doing pretty well. 
So I have not seen the results, so I cannot comment about that because it did not come and it was not initiated by the NIH, no, uh, nor authorized by NIH. But I can tell you honestly that vitamin C can increase the reactive oxygen species, so oxidative stress. And if you have too much oxidative stress, that is especially related to mutations uh, related to uh, succinate dehydrogenase, can actually lead to apoptosis of the cells. And that was uh, that was actually shown in that article that we published, I think, approximately approximately two years ago. We were thinking about the vitamin C, the ascorbic acid, to use in the clinical trial. But because I told you that we have just now about four or five clinical trials, it needs also some hands and, you know, of course, resources. So it's just, you know, on, on hold right now. But we think that there is something in the vitamin C that could be considered for uh, for treatment in some patients, at least some supportive treatment that uh, will definitely, we feel that will not definitely be harmful if anything, you know, could help a patient to deal with some metastatic disease. So maybe that's a future research article we'll be reading. I think, you know, if we do it, you know, on patients and then some, some good population of patients, that that would be good. And the same, you know, like to do the immunotherapies, that I think that there will be, there will be some interest in immunotherapies. Uh, uh, there were some interesting results. I think that they came from MD Anderson. There was definitely promising results. About 40% responded. I think it was pembrolizumab or... Uh, something similar, you know, to checkpoint inhibitors. And uh, we feel that there is also something interesting in the future that we, instead of systemically to put, you know, intravenously that, you know, the medication goes into into the entire body. This is why the patients also have, you know, some side effects, for example, hepatitis. They can have a, you know, thyroid problem, pituitary problem. They can have a GI problem. They can have, for example, inflammation in GI. We feel, and we are working on that here for the last about three or four years ago, first three years, for three or four years, uh, that we are working on to put the intratumoral therapy, I mean, to put the immunotherapy into the tumor. We call it intratumoral immunotherapy. And we feel that this is something that that's can be very promising in the future because the dose is much smaller, goes only in the tumor, does not go in systemically, so does not affect, you know, some other organs and can be very efficient and very successful. Of course, we do experimental work, but we feel that this experimental work is so promising that we, in the future, we are really thinking, you know, how to put something into the clinical trial. And for your information for patients, there are approximately 30 to 40 clinical trials that are focusing on intratumoral immunotherapy. Not, of course, for pheochromocytoma paraganglioma for some other tumors, but we feel that it could be actually also try for uh, some patients, specific patients, not for, for everybody, you know, for uh, the, those who actually suffering from uh, pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. Okay, very good. I've had one more question, and we're going to make this our last question. Um, this patient is 30 years old. They have SDHD. Um, mm -hmm. They had a few neck paras. Um, one is inoperable, uh, vagal. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They've been doing sandostatin, but mm -hmm. and there's no growth for a couple of years, and their doctor wants to stop that. Should they stop that treatment, or should they continue? Huh. It's 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 not easy response. You know what they can do if it is for for several years and everything is stable, you can stop it and see you know what is uh, what is happening. In some patients, and we saw it before, if you stop it, you know uh, those tumors will be stabilized and will be stabilized for long or longer period of time. The drawback is that if you stop it you have to actually check on these tumors on the regular basis to make sure that they they are not growing again. So at least, you know, mm -hmm. maybe every six 
months, maybe at the beginning, after three months, and then after six months, there are no really guidelines, but you can do it, mm-hmm. definitely. And then to see, you know, what's going on. And we had some patients that uh, who receive actually this therapy, it was stopped and they were doing uh, pretty well for a longer period of time that the tumors were stabilized. So if the patient does not have any side effects, doing well, insurance is actually covering that. They feel comfortable. They don't mind, you know, to have this therapy every month. And as I said, no side effects and feeling well, they can also continue. <coughs> they can also continue with this uh, type of treatment. So there is no straightforward answer, but both options are actually okay. But you have to have regular scans if you stop the therapy just to make sure that is not growing again because you have to restart it or you have to do something else. For example, if you stop it and it's growing and you don't want to restart it, you can have, for example, external beam radiation. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, I don't have any more questions. Thank you so much for doing this. And you're, you're always great every year. And maybe next year will be our third annual fireside chat. So thank you so much for doing this with us today. Yeah. Thank you so much once again, you know, for the invitation, of course, you know, my pleasure and especially my pleasure, you know, to help many patients. I would like to say that I don't know who is around because, you know, these virtual meetings, you don't see anybody around. You see only yourself or your moderator. But I wanted to say to patients who are around just now listening to our uh, actually discussion. So don't be afraid, you know, to send me your questions. And I will be definitely very happy, you know, to answer it. Uh, many of you know me that whatever whatever I promise I do. And except when I am on travel. So I will be on travel for six days starting on uh, December 16. But otherwise I will be here and I will be happy to communicate with you and help uh, uh, help you uh, to answer further answer, you know, certain questions that maybe were not uh, actually uh, mentioned. Otherwise, I would like to wish everybody very nice, very pleasant uh, holiday season, and uh, especially, you know, to be in very good health and uh, to enter the 2022 in good spirit and. Uh, uh, with uh, good atmosphere, and I hope that uh, after we went through in 2020, 2021, with all these things, you know, related to pandemics and you know other uh, other problems, I hope that there will be there will be better. And uh, uh, just as I said, wish you all the best and good health. And really, if you want, you know, you can always uh, uh, send me. Uh, your question and I will be happy uh, to communicate with you and to help you and thank you once again thank you sir for the invitation really great uh, great pleasure and I have to say honor always honor okay thank you very much have a great holiday enjoy your travels we'll see you next time thank you, thank you. appreciate it be safe and well okay. bye-bye all right you bye-bye. too bye-bye, bye-bye.